today I want to go through a water reaction energy diagram. I want to take this picture that we teach in high school chemistry and I want to translate it in very good physics detail. I want to go through what a reaction looks like and, and make, it, make it bring up some questions that you may have had that we've ignored and answer some of those questions hopefully. So if you've taken high school chemistry, I'm sure that you've seen these and I, I remember teaching them as being very simple. If the line goes up, then it's endothermic because energy is going into this whatever. If the line ends up lower than what it started, it was exothermic. And I remember a lot of kids would, would look at that and say, okay, I get it. Because the line went up, it's endothermic. And because the line went down, it's exothermic. And they were translating the problem into a solution. And that gave them a very false sense of confidence. Now, after teaching for a while, I have seen that there's a couple of problems that we have in thermo that tend to come up quite a bit. And, and one of my solutions to that is to show you the following. So this is a picture of an ice cube melting. And then over here I have an aqueous solution. It's supposed to be where I've mixed two chemicals. A chemical reaction is happening and the water temperature is going up. Okay. For the ice cube melting, the, the enthalpy of that is positive, the enthalpy change of that is positive. It's an endothermic process. And to most people that makes perfect sense. You're putting an energy to the ice cube in order to get it to melt. This also tends to make sense to most people. When you're doing a chemical reaction and the water heats up, that's exothermic because your chemicals are releasing energy. But put together, I think it raises an interesting point. And that is, this one I'm adding energy to, and it looks like this one I'm also adding energy to. The water is increasing in temperature. So why is this one endothermic and this one is exothermic? They're very similar in the result. And so I think it's very important that we spend a little bit of time saying the following. Anytime you have something occurring that's endothermic, something else is happening that's exothermic. When this ice cube melts, something is something somewhere is pushing on those molecules, whether it's air or, the, or whatever it's on the surface. Something is pushing on those molecules, making them go faster that it itself is, is losing in, in speed likely. Okay. So anytime there's something endothermic, there's something exothermic that accompanies that and vice versa. This process here, when I say that that's exothermic, I'm being very specific towards the chemicals that are in this. If it's dissolving, it's the interactions between the chemicals and the, and the water molecules they're interacting with. But I need to have that level of specificity because the water is endothermic. Much like this ice cube being melted, this water heating up is an endothermic process, but I don't care about that endothermic process. And so what, what you choose to look at is very, very important for how we do this. And so I think this kind of illustrates that when I'm looking at a diagram like this and I'm saying it's endothermic or exothermic, it's very important that I hammer down very well what's endothermic, what's exothermic, what am I tracing in this map that, that I care so much about. Okay. So, so as I go through and I want to specify what, what it is that I, that I have in this, let's start breaking it down. If you've, if you've seen these before in a with labels on them. Usually the label on here is energy, enthalpy, something along those lines. But it doesn't always say what. Energy of what? Enthalpy of what? And it's of the chemicals, all of the chemicals that are that are taking place in this chemical reaction. Okay? Uh, and it, it, it wouldn't make sense to really say it's of the reactants or the products because it's, it's of the whole mixture and, and it progresses through the reaction. So I start with all reactants here and that's the energy of all those chemicals, but as they change positions and speeds, that's their final energy at the end. Uh, and this is usually not something I can assign a number to. So for me to say, oh, this chemical has this much total energy, you know, it's very subjective and very difficult to analyze. So usually this is more of a relative of before and after. I, I don't know where this line should go. I don't know where this line should go, but I do know how far apart this should be. Okay, so things like that tend to make sense and, and people do okay with them. But now I want to go through and I want to look at, let's say we have two chemicals reacting. What does that look like with regards to this diagram? Okay, so over here I have A colliding with a BC molecule. And I'm going to end up with AB bonded together. Okay, so I'm going to end up, I'm going to draw this in a little over here. And C free by itself. So let's assume two things happen here. First, let's assume that A and B, C are traveling towards each other, but they're going very, 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 very slowly. What will happen when they hit? Okay, well, what's going to happen is A and B and C are going to bounce off of each other and go back in the other directions. 
So we're going to see these two things coming together, collide, and go back apart. And let's assume that collision is elastic. Let's assume nothing happens with this bond. What is happening in that collision is a physics question, and let's bring that up for now. So when these two collide, they have to change their velocity. This is traveling in this direction, ends up traveling it probably backwards in the, in the opposite direction. This is traveling in this way, it's going to probably go back in the other direction. So if the velocity is changing, this is, there's an acceleration, which means there's a force between A and B when they collide. And we want to compare that force with the bonding force of B and C. There's an attraction for B to stick to C, an attraction for C to stick to B. Okay, there's a, there's a force between those two. And when these two things collide, there's a new force induced, and that is that B is getting pushed by A. Okay, so, so well, when they collide with just a small velocity, not much is going to happen. So if I trace that back on this diagram here, what I'm essentially saying is that I start with my chemicals, and at this point they start to interact with each other a little bit more so when they're far apart. And so as they start to repel each other, they start to push, and that starts to separate B and C from each other. And as I separate them more and more, I move up more and more on this curve. But for this, I'm only going to end up up here. I'm going to end up where there's a small disturbance of BC, and then things are going to go back to the way that they were. Okay, and I'm going to end up with B and C still bonded together, and A still by itself. But then if I take this whole process, and I, and I change things up, and all of a sudden I raise the temperature, and now A is going to come in very fast, and B is going to come in very fast, what's now going to happen is their velocity change is much greater. In order for them to ricochet off of each other, they would have to have a very large acceleration. A large acceleration means that I'm going to have a large force. So now, when I look at the force on B, I have C pulling B in this direction, but I also have A exerting a force on it that might make it to the point where that force will no longer be able to hold those in place. And so at that point, what's going to happen is I'm going to make it up to the top of this curve, and I'm going to be able to separate apart that bond. Now after that point, I've now pulled everything apart. Now I have more potential energy amongst those three atoms. B could then return to A and end up bonded to A, causing it to decrease in potential energy again. Okay. Now let's go through what happens then. So if A and B and C, let's say they hit, they collide with each other and they react. Okay. Let's say we're looking at this reaction here that's in the red. So what that means is, let's say the bond strength between B and C is about that strong, and A and B, C, they come and they smack together. When, when these two things are separating from each other, because they're increasing in their potential energy, that's going to be slowing them down. So there's this force of attraction between them, and as you're pulling them apart, that motion that you had going, the temperature and, and, the, and how fast these two things collided, the B and the C are slowing down as they move apart from each other because they have that force of attraction between them. And so as you're moving up in here, you're starting to slow down that molecule. And then, afterwards, you get A and B coming together. Well, those two things are a force of attraction between them. So as they move closer and closer together, they're going to start to speed up. And so when you're done, now things are moving faster. Now for an exothermic reaction like this, what happens is, is when you break that bond, things slow down. But then when you remake the new bond, things speed up. And for an exothermic, the bond you make has a stronger force of attraction than the bond you break. And that means you're going to get more speeding up than you are slowing down. And so over time, when this keeps happening, you're ending up with molecules gaining speed and gaining speed. Well, they're now moving at a faster velocity. That means it's higher temperature. And we would say then you've transformed some of that potential energy between the electrical forces in those atoms into how fast they're moving. Okay. Now, in, in energy terms, then we would have said that you've created, you know, the potential or electrical or chemical energy into kinetic energy and temperature, and and that's what we tend to think of for exothermic. We are we are converting that chemical energy into energy released to us as motion. Okay. Now, if we contrast that with the second set down here, let's say these are also traveling together and they're they're going to hit really hard and they're they're moving really fast. But let's say in this case that B and C have a really, really strong attraction for each other. And then when A and B bond, they have an attraction for each other, but it's not as strong. Okay? So now we're looking at this curve. Now when A and B and C collide, 
they really need to hit because they have to break apart a very, very strong bond. And as they do so, they are slowing down. So even though they're coming at a tremendous speed, when they hit and they start to really kind of stretch and separate that apart, they're slowing down. Once they've, once they've separated though, A can now bond with B and that's going to cause them to accelerate, but that's not a very strong force of attraction between them. So as they, as they move through this part of the process where they're coming back together, they're speeding up, but they're not speeding up nearly as much as they had slowed down in the beginning part. So what's going to happen over time in this endothermic reaction is that you're going to have molecules slowing down more than they're speeding up. And as that happens more and more, you're accumulating a lower temperature. So from our perspective, that endothermic reaction is cooler at the end than it was before. Now, if I look at the energy here, it looks like I end up with more energy than I started. Specifically, that is the chemical or potential or electrical energy of the molecules, of the bonding, and not how fast they're moving. The, how fast they're moving is something that's easily translated into other things around this chemical reaction. So if I'm doing an endothermic reaction and I put my hands near it, my hands are going to feel cold because energy from my hands is traveling uh, towards the air molecules that have been giving energy to this and causing that to happen. Um, and so all of those things that surround this help push to break this bond over and over again. And they don't get a lot of kickback from when they form the new bond. And so over time this will feel colder and colder as that progresses. So I think that within this diagram we should be able to translate that into a picture of here are some chemicals reacting. And that's a very simple basic reaction. But, but I like the idea that what we're doing now is we're sitting there and talking about you know when there's this force of attraction, this bond, what's that going to do when it breaks? What's that going to do when it forms? Well when it forms they're going to speed up. Okay, so as I'm transferring that potential energy as those two things come together, they're getting faster. And so my temperature is rising as that's occurring. And when I break the bond, the opposite. I am inputting potential energy at the expense of kinetic energy. And so therefore these things are slowing down. Okay, so that's my explanation of, of what you should kind of know for a reaction energy diagram. If you have that in the back of your head, I think that things that we add on to that tend to become a lot easier. It's very commonplace to kind of analyze the idea that between these two points there's the difference in energy, of course, and that affects your thermo, your enthalpy, etc. It affects your equilibrium and it affects your voltage if we're looking at a redox reaction. And then in between those two we're looking at kinetics. I think once we have that picture of this then we can go through at a higher level and say, okay, well, why would, you know, this reaction be slower than this, this one here that I had originally? Well, because that bond is more difficult to break, that's not going to happen very often that I have two things colliding at such a high, high speed. And so that reaction is not going to happen very frequently, and so therefore my kinetics is now slower. Whereas, how much energy do I get back out? That's irrelevant to how high this curve goes, because where I start and where I end, is going to determine that. If I end up having to take a bunch of energy to break the bond, but then I get more back, well, what's the difference? And so my equilibrium and my electrochem and my thermo all relate to the starting and ending point, and the kinetics is influenced by what happens in the middle. I think all of those things become a lot clearer when we have a good, solid picture involving physics of how to tie that into the reaction energy diagram.